this class of endogenous uh, modeling with knowledge, R&D, blueprints, ideas, uh, generally uh, technology and institutions driven uh, uh, or ideas driven uh, uh, endogeneity <coughs> has created conditions for endogenous growth, but as such, it is mostly a theoretical curiosity until now. Now I'm going to talk uh, about uh, a series of uh, uh, ideas on how to make this approach policy relevant. As you will recall, the Romerian R&D formulation which is the main source of growth of this economy, is based on the idea that new research, new blueprints, new ideas, new set of knowledge is the end result of three factors. Productivity, taken as uh, exogenous. Number of researchers working for research and the level of existing stock of knowledge. And uh, as we had uh, dealt with, the implication is that as a result, the overall equilibrium endogenous self-sustained growth of this economy is based on a bunch of numbers. Let me just copy them from here. Is this sort of a endogenous growth uh, <coughs> equilibrium uh, notation? Now, uh, <coughs> as you see, all of these are parametric, except for the total labor supply. And uh, I'm just going to come to this for a moment. But uh, if you try to uh, make a sense of what we have, the alphas that appear are coming from the uh, GDP production function. It is the share of the intermediate inputs in output. That is, uh, <coughs> this is the share of intermediates, which is the end result of pure research. That's what the uh, what alpha plays role. Gamma is the productivity of researchers. It doesn't play a crucial role in this analysis. And theta, and theta comes from a preference maximizing uh, consumer, which is maximizing uh, the utility over an infinite time horizon. And it is the uh, <coughs> intertemporal elasticity of substitution. The higher is this elasticity or the lower the marginal utility of uh, uh, income, what uh, it generates is it dampens the equilibrium rate of growth. Another thing that dampens the equilibrium rate of growth is the subjective discount rate. And uh, you know that if agents are impatient, that is, the higher is the row, that is, they want to consume right away, they uh, discount the future consumption more heavily, meaning that they want to uh, push or uh, bring consumption today, then uh, it also dampens the rate of growth. <clears throat> now what remains is the total supply of labor. Now, Charles Jones from University of Chicago he pioneered a critique against the overall rate of growth 
that is coming out of this R&D function. It is, after all, this function that drives the whole system. Consumer preferences, intermediates, the so-called no arbitrage conditions, the price of research, etc., etc., are all driven by the intricacies of this function. What is here, as you uh, would remember, is that this implies that the rate of growth, which is a dot over a, pulling this a over here, is productivity times number of researchers. So if over time, if there is an increase in the number of researchers, the growth rate, it's not income, it's not the level of income, it's the rate of growth of income will also increase. So for example, increasing the number of researchers from 100 million to 120 million will increase the rate of growth through uh, all of these parameterization, but it will have an overlasting effect. Jones has given a, a couple of numbers. Let me share with you with them. He observes that in the United States, in the 1940s, before the war, the Second War, only 25% of population was uh, graduates of high school. Uh, they had high school diplomas, only one fourth. And uh, only 5% had uh, university diplomas. 5%. 5% of the American uh, population on working age had, had been a, a graduate of a university from uh, here and there. And about only one fourth, 25%, was uh, graduates of high school uh, level of education. Do you, do you know the, uh, well, let me just uh, finish this story. Late 1990s, the numbers in contrast are 80% have high school diplomas. They have finished the high school and uh, <coughs> 25% holds university degrees. So clearly, from the middle of the century to the end of the last century, 20th century, there is an increase in educated labor in the United States. In addition, the quality of uh, education had increased and the quality of labor had also increased because in addition to increases of, say, uh, university graduates from 5% to 25% of the whole population, there had been in-migration from uh, the, uh, the old German uh, uh, <coughs> block of countries, from the old Soviet system countries, from China and India, participating in the global labor market as wage labor. The expansion in the labor force, the educated, skilled labor force, is a true phenomenon. And in addition to uh, it, uh, there had been more participation of women, more participation of uh, uh, <coughs> handicapped or uh, uh, who are who were otherwise socially excluded from uh, the education uh, opportunities, there is clearly an increase in the, the educated, skilled labor force. Nevertheless, when you look at the overall 20th century, all through 20th century, from the turn of the century, from the uh, uh, 90s, from the Bell Epoch, 
the, uh, the roaring 30s, uh, the war devastation, the Great Depression, the <coughs> emergence of the uh, Golden Rule, etc. The American rate of productivity growth was 1.8% on average per annum. Rate of growth of productivity of uh, US productivity growth on average. This is annual. But we would have expected an increase in the growth rate because clearly educated, skilled labor who is destined in a research uh, uh, uh, occupations have increased. So some, something must have gone wrong. This number had not accelerated in a meaningful fashion. From this observation, Jones criticized the Romerian uh, technology function. And I, as I had been uh, uh, saying many times, maybe this is the third or fourth time, this is shockingly brilliant uh, in intervention to uh, uh, economics as, as science. This is one of the most powerful uh, ideas. It is simple and very elegant. What it does is by simply moving at, uh, <clears throat> the level of technology, it is seemingly a very simple algebraic operation. A dot is here, level of A is here, A dot over A, very simple, elegant, uh, forceful uh, algebraic operation. You convert this to a growth rate form, A dot over A, and on the other side there are only two variables. Productivity, assume it whatever you want, the number pi, your favorite number, God's number, number three, seven, seven days a week, whatever. It doesn't mean much, but this is, of course, crucially important. But uh, it cannot fit these facts. So what must have happened? John's idea is this. He says that, uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. The productivity growth rate, or so, sorry, the R&D generation or the R&D growth rate must be something on the order of some researchers working, but they shouldn't have constant returns as over here without any power over here, but it must be subject to some diminishing returns. And these diminishing returns, according to it, uh, lambda being less than one, is reflecting the idea that researchers may be simply duplicating previous work. Previous work, previous research. That is, there is duplication. For example, right now, Many of you are taking this interdisciplinary research seminar project courses. Do, do you feel that uh, your roughly about five new projects per each section, roughly on the order of 30 projects written this year, most of them are perhaps new ideas, but at least some of them are previous ideas, perhaps redone in new research, some new literature, but it is mostly uh, uh, not duplication entirely, intihal filan demiyorum, sakın yanlış anlamayın, but uh, the old ideas are recirculated. Suriyeli göçmenlerin Türk iş gücü piyasalarının etkisi. Uh, just almost a decade ago, estimating the money demand function for the Turkish economy, a Kagan approach. Uh, 
what will be the economic effects of Turkey entering the European Union? At least I have uh, had uh, three or four doctoral dissertations. I'm not saying this is futile work or this is uh, intihal or I mean just, this is how research is moving. It, we do not just move up and down in, in jumps. Things are incre incremental and then uh, all of a sudden there is a big change, then again th things are incremental. So Romer's idea that each one of you comes up with a brilliant, fresh, net new idea is not the nature of things. Many of the new ideas are hybrid extensions of old ideas that uh, each net new R&D does not generate constant returns on research, researchers, but they are subject to duplications. So people work day and night, 12 hours a day, but at the end of the day, uh, the research outcome is one net new line, for example. So this is the idea of duplication, which makes Romerian R&D growth less powerful than he stipulated. Secondly, when it comes to research, well, uh, some of the incre incredible ideas simply may simply get lost. And uh, using John's notation, this is also uh, a diminishing returns factor. Phi is some parameter and uh, it reflects the, uh, the notion that some new ideas or some new knowledge which had been created, very powerful, but alas, it tended to be for, uh, forgotten. It could not find a uh, vent for a uh, new patent, a new commercial uh, uh, identity, whatever. That uh, knowledge <coughs> is forgotten. Not all new knowledge is applied to research or is applied to production. Some of them are redundant. Do not ask me what's a redundant knowledge. Knowledge is always precious. That's why this is not zero. But not all new knowledge is amenable to uh, patents and uh, application. One very crucial uh, uh, unfortunately, anecdotal data, I couldn't come up with the, uh, the evidence, but uh, I listened to this in a, a conference presentation. The, uh, the evidence was that only one out of 2,000 uh, inventions could have been patented on average in the uh, US. And out of these patented ideas, I don't know, a new wheel, uh, uh, a new coffee machine, uh, uh, whatever, only one out of 20,000 has profitable market success. But 1,999 of other ideas most probably served this one lucky patented idea. I am not saying that this is completely futile, but it was, from the market point of view, it had been redundant. So uh, not all knowledge is uh, useful. It is also subjecting to diminishing returns, and researchers are uh, also in an effort which are uh, uh, subject to diminishing returns. This is John's view. Now, if you uh, convert this to 
a similar growth rate form, like in Romer. Observe that a dot over a, which the growth rate of the Jonesian world, is again gamma L a lambda a to the power phi minus 1. Observe that the more research, phi is less than 1. Therefore, this is the more research you produce, the less will be its new contribution to a rate of growth. The more population you have, the less will be its contribution on new rate of growth. If this were true, uh, divide both sides of this. A. Pardon. Did I go? Uh, uh, okay. <coughs> this is the extension of in growth rate form. Uh, but if this were a true or a more correct characterization of how research is generated, we must have had this sort of a relationship. Growth rate, 19, 1999. That somewhere throughout 1950s, this growth rate, this is the growth rate, all right? The rate of growth, not per capita income. It's the rate of growth of per capita income. This growth rate, uh, uh, <coughs> or per capita income, that's, mm, no, I will just do this. This thing was constant at 1.8% for a while. Then it will tend to taper off because of the increase in LA and the increase in fee. That would have been the Jones characterization of a world. What did we observe? We observed a constant 1.8% realized. But in the meantime, these factors have had occurred. Meaning that what Jones would have expected has not materialized because of these countervailing observations. Number of graduate diplomas had increased, women's participation had increased, there had been inflow of foreign researchers into the US economy. Therefore, this had been counteracted by an increase in researchers. We had been lucky that these have had happened. With these, in the Romerian framework, the growth rate must have had accelerated. This is a complete story. What would have expected by Romer? This had not happened because research was subject to diminishing returns, and this had been contracted by uh, exogenous factors such as the increase in the, the skilled labor force. Well, OK, we survived the 20th century. But this tendency remains for you and for your offsprings uh, for the, the late 21st century. So if you look at the 21st century beyond to the uh, next millennium, the same uh, tendencies for diminishing returns will continue 
and humanity must find new ways of countering these diminishing returns tendencies. It could be Sanai 4.0, the 5G Valley, robots, uh, colonization of Mars, fight against the, the other galaxies, I don't know. And I'm not that interested. Maybe you have uh, better uh, uh, dreams. But, uh, uh, but if in the next century, this sort of an innovative external push does not occur, does not occur, then the upcoming slowdown of the US economy is imminent. So Jones, this famous article, is titled the upcoming slowdown of US economy. Very gloomy. A, quite a pessimist title. For the next century, you mean? Uh, well, uh, I'm not aware for uh, dates. But the tendency, if the same format of these lambdas and fees are occurring, uh, it is roughly in the next 150 years. The OECD has uh, come up with a, a, a title uh, of the slowdown of the European economies in the next 75 years, provided that these empirics of lambda and phi remain as such, that there is not an increase in these, or a change in these numbers. It is roughly uh, discussed as about 150 years into the future. But we are not uh, looking at uh, the coffee cup. There is no uh, uh, depiction of the uh, uh, crystal ball. Uh, Very good question. Uh, the question is, uh, uh, as actually, uh, the question is, why not after 1950s? Actually, you may generalize this question. Why back in the Industrial Revolution, that uh, uh, the rate of growth of the British economy under the Industrial Revolution, it's called the revolution, but the uh, British economy's growth rate is 0.8%. After centuries of 0% growth rate, Britain's 0.8% under the mid 18th century, under the Industrial Revolution, it's a revolutionary number. The question can be raised, why didn't we see a tapering off of the growth rate immediately with the Industrial Revolution? Well, uh, there, are, there had been always uh, measures countervailing this tendency uh, of the uh, growth rate to decline. Colonization is one perfect example. Uh, the opening up of the uh, uh, Americas is another example. Uh, the point is, well, uh, whatever could have been found back then, colonization, the First World War, uh, the, uh, some of the ideas had been really uh, uh, incredibly, uh, like the, uh, the railways, the big petrochemicals industry, etc. This we have survived by the increased expansion in the educated labor force. Well, what next? Uh, will the industry 4.0, or robots, will they be sufficiently strong to countervail the rate of growth is a dubious question. Well, uh, uh, let's say rough life will be hard. But let's, let's, let's see, uh, based on this question, uh, 
Let's look at the mathematics once again. This is our growth rate. <coughs> this is the growth rate of the economy under Jones. Gamma LA to the power lambda. And A to the power, I'm going to write this this way. It's clearer, uh, minus to the power 1 minus theta. If you do this trick again, take log of both sides, log gamma plus lambda log LA minus 1 minus theta log of A. First take the logarithm and then take the time derivative. Then take the, the log dt of both sides. This will be 0. This is 0 plus lambda. The derivative of this thing is L dot over L minus 1 minus theta A dot over A. Starting from the equilibrium growth rate, I have taken the rate of change of the logarithm over time. In this simplification, let's call this a population growth rate, but it is not the rate of growth of population. It is the rate of growth of educated labor force population. So uh, I'm simply going to write h over here to distinguish it from n. It is not the rate of growth of, yani herkes üç çocuk yapsın değil bu. Herkes üç çocuğu eğitsin. Educated, the rate of increase of the educated or human capital, uh, it's you guys. Uh, and this is, in my notation, my growth rate. So if you play this around, we have 0 is equal to lambda times h minus 1 minus theta times the growth rate. And the growth rate will be <coughs> lambda h over 1 minus theta. This is the equilibrium growth rate in general form, originating from Jonesian R&D function. Lambda times h, 1 minus theta. This is the most general form. This is more or less when, what, uh, when it's likely to happen uh, uh, generalization. Uh, you can study this case by case. First of all, uh, case one, suppose that lambda is one. Right? Uh, and phi is one. Uh, pardon, uh, phi is... Uh, Lambda is one, phi is zero. O da olmuyor. Şöyle diyelim. Phi is one, but h is zero. This is Romer. We agreed that, well, uh, this is not very uh, realistic because h had not been zero due to this evidence. So we have lambda is one perhaps, h is a positive number, and phi is zero, then what we will have is the growth rate will be <coughs> simply the rate of increase of number of researchers, population growth rate, of the R&D function. The rest of the system operates 
with the intermediate firms coming up into action. They look at their uh, no arbitrage condition. They look at their uh, uh, allocation of labor wage rate, WA, WY. Crank, crank, crank, crank. Introduced with a subjective uh, discount rate with the consumers. At the end of the day, we are more or less back to Solov. But in Solov, this was an exogenously given population growth rate. Here, this is the uh, research, num research population driven growth rate. And this age can be changed through economic policies by subsidizing education, subsidizing salaries of the university professors, subsidizing you guys uh, uh, one way or another. This is uh, where economic policy matters. A third case could be lambda is equal to 1, h is 0, and phi is uh, equal to also uh, 1. That is a third case, lambda 1, phi is 1, as in uh, Romer, and h is a positive number, then uh, this is an explosive work. There is no uh, uh, bound, no equilibrium. Uh, and this had not been proven uh, either. Any comments? Anything you want to add? Anything you want to clarify? Intervene one way or another? This is one of the possible cases, but it is part of reality. H is definitely observed to be positive. It is not zero. It's the rate of growth of educated labor had been strictly positive. That is true. As a result of assuming a constant or a, a rising uh, uh, research personnel growth with no duplication effort over here and with no externality coming from the uh, research. That is, phi is zero. This is a subset of Jones formulation that will be, uh, if you plug in the numbers, a dot is equal to uh, gamma la to the power lambda with lambda less, with lambda uh, one. But uh, uh, a dot over a will be uh, dependent on the rate of growth of H. Um, I do not get the complete ideology between the duplication. What it implies? What it implies is this. The, the question is, what do we mean by duplication of uh, researchers' activity? Too many resources are being devoted to research researchers, but their rate of increase of ideas is not constant. If there is no lambda here, what we have is an increase yeah, uh, by researchers increase the rate of growth by the same magnitude. But if there were duplication, people are producing the same idea by uh, uh, more devotion of resources. Uh, I mean, you cannot say that uh, it's very hard to disentangle between uh, new net addition. This is not quantifiable uh, knowledge. Some knowledge sits there for centuries and then all of a sudden turns out to be crucial. That is, that's, that's what we know. Uh, that's a rate, actually, not uh, decreasing. That's, a that's an uh, overall average of the past roughly 50 years of 
fruits of existing research. That is not all new net additional knowledge generates at the end of the day net new uh, potential profitable idea. Remember what Romer had uh, thought of was that a dot is clearly creating each new idea produces one new net intermediate input. That's very powerful. What data says is that not all new net new idea generates one net new intermediate input. That is uh, what these numbers are saying. We are roughly camouflaging uh, this uh, entity by saying that some of the net new knowledge tends to be redundant. Some of it is, or we knew it already, but we are still uh, uh, expecting things to be profitable in Iran. Let me just add a, a foreign economy twist, and then we'll be uh, gone. Uh, OK, just uh, uh, I'll try to make it fun. Maybe not, not brief, perhaps, but uh, that will be fun. Uh, Anyway, it's raining outside. Uh, it's, uh, you are secure, warm, and comfortable. Just enjoy the, uh, the, the expansion of ideas. Uh. Okay. Uh, before we go on, uh, is that growth plan explosive in a sense that? Uh, 1.8, 2.8, 5.8, 10.8, that sort of a number. No, no, that's a good question. We are actually, what this 1.8% is the rate of growth of productivity. It's actually the potential growth rate. The business cycle is uh, uh, oscillating around it. It's subject to uh, the population growth rate, uh, the shocks to the economy, oil prices, etc., etc. This 1.8% is the rate of TFP, productivity growth rate. Another whole class of applications, among which uh, uh, I had the uh, chance of participating as well uh, in the late 90s. Uh, uh, and it is the idea of relative prices and different sectors competing for different resources. And the, uh, the main uh, uh, distinction could be driven by a rural sector and an industrial sector. So there is a YR and let's say there is a YI. And then there is an intermediates and then there is also a research sector. Take a research uh, any way you want. Uh, uh, if you want, just assume a Romerian gamma LA times A. The point is not the shape of the R&D function for the moment. But uh, <clears throat> there are two research, uh, sorry, there are two sectors. And uh, the rural sector uses rural labor force to some one minus alpha, enjoys intermediates, whatever the level of technology is. And these intermediates are indexed by I, as before. But they are the intermediates used in rural sector. Tractors, bichar dovers, pulluks, uh, uh, uh, uh, new sorts of seeds. Domateslerin tadı bozuldu çünkü İsrailliler bize tohum satmıyorlar. That sort of a thing, right? Uh, the agro business, agro uh, research. Uh, again to the power alpha. I'm making things as much as possible to fit in the notation of what we had uh, uh, done thus far. And then uh, the industrial GDP, manufactured items, we use Educated labor force, technicians, not 
farm labor force, not rural earth. And like rural economy, we use intermediates used in industry now. And LA is also going to the R&D sector. And we have rural labor plus LA, and this is my labor supply. What is the difference from the previous formulation, the uh, classic traditional uh, uh, formulation? There we have had LA plus LY. And LY was going to business, and LA was going to research. But now we have not LY, we have two distinct activities in the economy, a rural economy. Farmers working with intermediates came up from the laboratory. Again, uh, uh, some oligopolis had generated uh, intermediates for the farm economy, so on and so forth. But industry is competing with the R&D sector and educated technicians, computer scientists, people who could have gone to research and produce research is in manufacturing, in let's say Aselsan, doing uh, manufactured items. Or they are working in, a, uh, I don't know, uh, Toyota company in generating robotics in uh, uh, producing cars. From the shape of these functions, this educated guy, right, with a diploma hand, Bill Kent, Abdullah Hatalar, Erin Cheldan signed. You are uh, uh, in the job market. Hocam ben akademiye gitmek istemiyorum. Ben uh, iş dünyasına gitmek istiyorum. Tamam. Uh, okay. uh, so this guy goes over here, produces industry. Or, well, the moment this decision is done, there is one less researcher over here that could have generated new ideas, new knowledge, new R&D, which is ultimately the main source of growth. So if you have had a sector which is computing with the R&D sector in allocating labor, then <coughs> subsidizing this sector will end result generating lower rate of growth. To compensate for this, two ideas had been formulated. One, add something like, uh, let me write over here, let's say FDI. Or, um, let, me, let me rewrite this, let me generalize on this. Take it back. Add something here. One of the candidates for something is opening up the Krugman idea. More imports in GDP. Another idea, the same things, could be the share of FDI in GDP. Foreign domestic, foreign direct investment. All of these are bringing foreign R&D into the domestic R&D. And in a nutshell, if you were, uh, for example, if you have had two sectors, let's say rural, and this is my industry, Suppose that rural economy was the importing sector and the industry was the exporting sector. You know by heart from uh, the uh, very first days of this lecture that 
when you have only two sectors due to Walras law, trade balance is always in order. You remember this, right? That is price of M times M minus price of egg, uh, exports times exports is zero. And uh, if this were uh, an importing sector, this must be the world price. And this were uh, the supply of exports, this is the demand for exports. This must be the export price. The East Asian country experiences, Japan in particular, what they had done or what they had been doing, somewhat this is true for Korea, but definitely true for Japan, is they are <coughs> protecting their agriculture and either subsidizing or simply leaving it to the free world prices in a competitive fashion in terms of the industrial output. If you look at back how Japan or how the East Asian trade policy had shaped, once we put a protection, let's say by a tariff, the price is increased. Therefore, the relative price of the rural economy to the relative price of the industrial economy is protected that the terms of trade tilt in favor of the rural economy domestically. In this sort of a setup, what will it do to the R&D sector? What would you expect? Let me rewrite the question again. Two sectors. Agriculture is an importing sector, and it is protected by tariffs or whatever, so that domestically the price of the agricultural good had increased relative to the price of the industrial good, or vice versa. Price of the industrial good has fallen relative to the price of agriculture as a result of your trade policy. You left industry open to world competition, efficiency prices, but you have distorted the prices in agriculture purposefully. What would you expect as a result of this setup in the growth rate of the R&D sector? What, will what kind of mechanisms would you expect? Exports may or may not increase. This is, uh, after all, we haven't changed the price. This is happening domestically. What happens domestically? What do you think? This thing is facing, going to the uh, industrial uh, uh, sector, where the wage rate in the industrial sector is, this is the price of industry which is falling relative to agriculture. So more people will go to R&D, less people will be going to industrial economy. Is that price for the producers or for the uh, There is no difference between, there is no other taxes or anything. This is uh, seen uh, by, by, by both producers and consumers. But this is not the world price. You have distorted the world price by the presence of a domestic tariff. <clears throat> by doing this sort of a thing, we uh, maintain a regular source of labor in the R&D sector, treat industry in the competitive prices efficiently, distort the prices in agriculture purposefully. So this is somewhat referred to as 
strategic trade policy rather than distorted or protected. We are strategically changing the price structure in favor of the R&D sector ultimately. <clears throat> this type of a behavior, the strategic trade policy, can be substantiated by putting FDI or share of imports uh, carrying foreign R&D into the R&D function. So this type of effect can be even uh, more uh, uh, strengthened. And uh, uh, you can open up the economy and expect returns from opening up for, from free trade. You can do the reverse, which is rather than uh, taxing agriculture, put a tax on exporting sector, and this will be uh, clearly disastrous. It will protect industry. It will uh, lower down the ADAT growth. It will lower uh, uh, the volume of trade, etc. So uh, rather than across the board free trade, we can <coughs> protect some sectors, especially those ones which are not competing against the R&D, and subsidize the others. Uh, or subsidize the R&D sector. But the bottom line, there is always room for policy intervention. That is, uh, market economy is Pareto inferior to policy interventions of this sort. And that's because you have externalities in this model. 